Okay, thanks for coming back, ladies and gentlemen, so promptly. Now, this next session is actually um, a trio of um, speakers moving swiftly one to the other, starting with, take that as the hint, yes. <laughs> we have Andy Thompson from uh, QA, followed by Susan Bailey from the University of Northampton, and then Kevin Streeter from the Open University. Andy, over to you. Thank you, Julie. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Andy Thompson uh, from QA, and uh, I've been asked to uh, spend 20 minutes um, discussing with you using Sophia in the commercial training world. Um, my responsibility at QA is to manage the skills consultancy uh, business there. Um, I represent QA on the Sophia Council, um, and I'm also a chair of the Sophia Council currently, so uh, my involvement with Sophia is fairly, fairly deep and fairly broad. Um, in terms of using Sophia in the commercial training world, um, the first thing I think I probably need to just establish is what um, we're talking about when we talk about the commercial training world um, and why that should be distinct. So providers, commercial training providers, are dealing generally with short courses, half a day to five days in duration. Um, the actual form of delivery isn't something that needs to concern us today, but they might be courses that are delivered uh, in a classroom uh, or over, uh, over the web um, or self-paced through e-learning or whatever. Right? So that, that set that to one side. The curriculum uh, that providers of a commercial training cover um, would be typically technology-specific skills sourced perhaps from the <laughs> vendors like Microsoft and Oracle, um, or written by their own subject matter experts. Professional skills and credentials such as PRINCE2 and uh, ITIL certification, where the syllabus is prescribed but the content is written and then approved by the certifying authority. And personal and management skills training, uh, which is usually entirely uh, developed in-house uh, by each, each uh, company. So QA and, and our competitors, some of whom are here today, um, so I've had to be very pragmatic about this, uh, offer learning solutions uh, in all of those uh, areas. Because of the business we're in, I felt it was just worth um, bringing out the fact that we're talking about commercial training. We're talking about commercial training in the world of IT and business change. So, of course, there's a whole industry of uh, training and uh, learning services in other professional fields. Um, and to an extent, um, this touches on us from time to time. When I'm engaging with clients, I'm asked, you know, we've got, we've got um, uh, finance staff and sales staff and marketing staff, all of whom could benefit from a framework like Sophia. Is there something like that that you know of? And I said, well, no, actually, Sophia is pretty unique in the world. Um, but there are equivalents in many of the other professional fields. What's interesting is that Sophia levels are really nothing to do with IT or business change at all. And Sophia levels are very well-rounded descriptions of uh, levels of responsibility in an organisation, whichever professional field you happen to be in, and can be transferred and migrated across. So what I want to do is just um, take a look at how clients of QA are typically uh, using Sophia. I was trying to think of a way of organizing uh, a big long list of, of client-related activity and, and really it breaks down, I think, into the, the vision and scope of Sophia within the organization. The, the, the smartest, most uh, skills-aware uh, organizations are using Sophia strategically to support organizational development, to ensure that they have full coverage of all the necessary um, functions and capabilities that business change and information technology and systems requires, and that there's no overlaps, there aren't teams doing similar roles in different places, there aren't gaps in their uh, capability. Also at that level, um, one or two of our clients have, who operate on a global scale use Sophia to provide the points of alignment so that teams in India, teams in the Far East, teams in the USA are operating to the same skills levels as teams in the UK and Europe. 
Now that's in the sort of long term. In the more uh, medium term, sort of looking from six months to a year ahead, um, a lot of our clients are commissioning QA or, or a competitor, if that's the way they go, to conduct a, a skills gap analysis or a skills audit. They basically want us to look at the population of their, their IT professionals and their um, project managers and business analysts and actually establish what skills are in place, what skills are needed, are there any gaps, are there any shortfalls. They might be doing this in order to populate a learning management system or that they're uh, working in partnership with the BCS to introduce Sophia Plus and they need to actually populate it with their own tailored profiles. Um, the third reason I've given there is that what they actually want is to have a learning portfolio, a curriculum that they can circulate and advertise internally that they know will be relevant to their teams and functions. And they want us to work with them to populate that portfolio with courses and solutions that are relevant to their staff. So this idea of, of uh, advertising an internal portfolio is quite a, quite a nice way of, of uh, applying Sophia in the medium term. Notice, though, that it, at that level, we're not talking about individual personal development plans. We're talking about providing a curriculum which is aligned to the job roles and the team's functions and which will provide an element of choice that individuals and their managers can, uh, can evaluate during their personal development reviews. But the shortest term um, engagement that we get involved with is the pure training needs analysis, where we are you know, asked to, to speak to 20 or 30 staff and basically uh, create personal development plans for each of them, identify where their skills gaps are, identify what their learning program should be over the next year, two years or so. Yeah. And that's actually a very uh, successful and, and uh, quick fix, if you like, in terms of addressing skills shortfalls in the short term. But the thing is here, and this sounds like heresy in the light of, of what both Ron and Alan said, um, is it's not all about people. Um, <laughs> if you're an organization and you're trying to deliver some capability, it's about function, it's about capability. It's about a top-down definition of what you need to be able to do in order to deliver the services that you need to deliver. Yes, the people issues come from the other direction. You need to bring people into those roles. But first of all, you need to define what it is you want the roles to do for you. So you need to... Um, uh, the, the most successful engagements we have are those in, uh, which are looking at the medium term here and which are looking at uh, role-based analysis rather than individual personal skills profiles because people are too complicated and too variable to actually get a clear picture of what's needed. So a role-based analysis then provides a longer-lasting, more sustainable view of the skills requirements in your business than a, a, a personal skills review, individual by individual. The reason for this are purely that individuals have different background issues, different, different levels of experience, um, different uh, aspirations, and that if you ask five or six people in the same team uh, what skills development they want, you'll get a, a, a varying picture. The skills profile gives you uh, 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 a keystone document which can then uh, be applied to anybody who wants to work in the team, anybody who is in the team who wants to develop their skills. Now, the key thing here is that the profile is not just a set of Sophia skills, although I would strongly argue that it should start with a set of Sophia skills. So the skills that define the professional capability of the role, whether it's business analysis, whether it's solution development, whether it's server engineering. Sophia descriptions then don't identify the particular products and technologies, so that needs to also be in the role profile, the technology specifics, along with the personal attributes, communication skills, um, team leading skills, that sort of thing that may be required in the role. And domain specifics, by which I mean the actual business that they're in. So if you're looking at a, um, an IT team in an insurance business, then how much of the insurance business do they need to understand? Do they need to understand who does what within the organization, where their applications are being used, where their servers are deployed, what the circumstances are? So the method of doing this then is a two-stage one. So first of all, 
one can um, assimilate a certain amount of information from um, organization charts, from job descriptions, from, if you like, the, the documentation that describes the capability and the communication lines within the organization. Who does what? What is this team responsible for? Uh, who do they report to? What are they responsible for? And from that, you understand really what the capability needs to be within that team and then what the roles are within the team. Now, it's okay carrying out a paper-based exercise. It's very important that you do that and that you, because you can take time to do that, you can, you can cross-reference lots of different sources of information. But always one would be aware that that's a kind of offline exercise and you need to actually go in and talk to people in the organisation to consolidate what you understand to be the, the case if you're conducting this kind of analysis. So the second stage then is to validate the skills profiles with the owner of the role. That is to say the person whose job it is to define what that role needs to be capable of. Now, so it's quite subtle this. The temptation is, well, to validate our skills profile, you need to talk to somebody in the job. But if you talk to somebody in the job, it's quite hard to distinguish what the role needs from what they see as being their strengths or weaknesses within the role. And so it's better to move up a level. Talk to their line manager, talk to the team leader, talk to the head of department. What do you expect this role to be able to do for you? What skills are you looking for from somebody in that role? So you get a very rounded, uh, complete definition of skills needed to uh, fulfil a particular job. The um, question can arise of whether that skills profile is actually part of the job description for someone. So if I'm, if I'm doing this analysis and I actually compile a document that says you need these skills, you need these technology specifics, you need these personal attributes and you need to have this experience in the industry... Uh, is that not a job description? <laughs> it's close to a job description. It doesn't include one or two other things that you would expect to see in a job description. Uh, but it rather depends on whether human resources are part of the exercise that you're carrying out or not. Because job descriptions are not generally owned by the, the, you know, the, the team, if you like. They're owned by HR. And so there are wider issues that need to be addressed in terms of personnel as staff representation, unions and so on, if you're going to change people's job descriptions to bring them in line with Sophia, then it changes other things, it changes relative alignments of jobs and so on. There's all sorts of things. Um, and so there are all sorts of reasons why skills profiles may be kept separate from a job description, but cross-reference to. So here's a job description for a um, service desk analyst. This document is owned by HR and maintained by HR, but it cross-references to this skill profile, which is maintained and owned by L&D, say, um, and uh, is linked one-to-one -one with, a, with a job description, but maintained separately. One of the problems, then, is that you end up not being able to see the wood for the trees. You've got lots and lots of role profiles, um, but you, uh, you need to be able to step back and see the big picture. How do all these role profiles fit together? Have we accounted for all the skills? How do we, how do we deal with career paths and movements between these roles? So it's very useful to bring together... Um, the, the sort of headline features of each profile and put them into a Sophia skills matrix. And there's an example on the next slide of a matrix that are created for, uh, for a local authority, London Borough of Lambeth. Um, and we looked at all the teams within their ICT uh, division. But this particular team is one that I'm using as an example, which was for application support. It was a team of about 40 staff in two teams of 20, um, and what we had here was, if I can use this pointer, um, they, we had four roles identified. The manager, there was one manager, there were two team leaders, and then there were 20 people who were either senior support officers or support officers. And the Sophia uh, profiling exercise produced a profile which generally had about half a dozen skills in each profile. So the profile for a senior support officer, for example had application support, which is a very conveniently named and described Sophia skill, but also these other skills uh, in support of that role. <coughs> so the team leader had a different set of skills. And the thing to notice here is uh, how the, not just the skill levels go up as you go from the junior role to the manager role, but the skills themselves are different skills. So somebody wanting to get from support officer to senior support officer, yes, needs to take these skills here, there's only one, sorry, two skills there, service desk and incident management, 
and application support that actually simply go up a level as you go from one roll to the next roll up. Otherwise, it's the, it's the accumulation of additional skills and additional capability to actually move to the next level up. And to move into the manager's role or the team leader's role, it's a completely different set of skills because the team leader and the manager are not there to support applications. They're there to manage the team. And Sophia reflects that. The profile reflects that. The highlighted skills we actually were able to use because, they, because Lambeth had deeply embedded Sophia into their um, uh, job descriptions, uh, we were able to use the highlighted skills descriptions as the purpose of each role in the, in the job description. So the role purpose is actually phrased using the Sophia description. And the figures at the bottom provide a sense check on the part of the analyst and, on the, uh, and confirmation to the manager that the average levels of Sophia skills are incrementing as you would expect them to between the junior roles, the middle roles, and the most senior roles. There is a danger, however, this was a very attractive um, uh, output of the exercise, and the, and the manager was very, oh, this is great, this is, you know, I, I, this is provided a view that they really hadn't seen before. But there's a danger then that uh, it becomes a number-based exercise, and, and people are, are looking at the next level up and, and uh, you know, moving from 4.1 to 4.2 or whatever, and it shouldn't be like that at all. You've got to really deal with the substance, deal with the descriptions. So there are a number of challenges relating to carrying out an exercise like that. Dealing with numbers is, is one such challenge. Um, another challenge is that, um, that the skill profiling exercise is conducted as an exercise in its own right. And commercially, from the learning provider's point of view, it doesn't go any further than that. You know, we've earned a couple of thousand pounds doing that for them, but there's no long-term business to be gained unless they can translate those skills into learning solutions for people moving in and around the organisation. But other challenges are more practical. The most common one probably is people seeing, uh, who see themselves as a level. What course do I need to go on to move to level five? Or what training do I need to move up to level four? They just see it as a mechanistic, go on a course, move up a Sophia level. And this is where Sophia is different to other skills frameworks. Skills frameworks except for Sophia, generally have however many levels. It goes from not having the skill to learning the skill to being competent to being expert. And that's, that's the scale of, of, of the skills framework. Sophia is much more subtle than that, where the levels are, are much more rounded. The levels, the descriptions are multidimensional. They reflect experience in the business, experience in IT, experience in business change, uh, and knowledge of the organisation. And this is all embedded and very clearly explained in the, in the skill descriptions. Another challenge is that the Sophia skills are too generic. You know, this, I, I just doesn't do anything. I, I've, read, I've read this skill and I can't see how it relates to my job at all. <laughs> it doesn't tell me what training I need. Um, and the problem then is that, yes, the Sophia descriptions are generic. They're not vendor-specific or product-specific. That needs to be added during the profiling process. And there must be local translations of the Sophia skills to role specifics, job specifics, software specifics. Programming level four, there is a good Sophia description, but it needs to result in, yes, okay, you need Java, you know, Enterprise Edition six to the level of Oracle certified professional. And excuse the, you know, once you get into the world of IT, it becomes rather arcane, but you know, it's obvious what that means to somebody in the trade. Yeah. Programming management level, sorry, project management level four. Yeah, it translates to, I don't know, Prince2 practitioner or you know, an APM certification as appropriate. The third challenge that I've identified on this slide is where Sophia skills are too complex and wordy to identify practical learning goals. I, did, I, I read my notes, I wrote the word waffly, because some, <laughs> some Sophia descriptions are quite lengthy, but they're lengthy because they're comprehensive. And they are effectively complete competency statements of a, of a job being done at a particular level of responsibility. But it's this complexity I want to deal with finally is the need to break down Sophia skills into identifiable learning, uh, learnable elements. So this is how we get from the Sophia framework to learning solutions. 
you take a Sophia description like business analysis at level four. This isn't. This is quite a short one in the in the framework, but you can just see at a glance there's a lot there to take in. And okay, yeah, I mean it's not you know we're all intellectually smart. We can take time to read it, uh, but you have to actually study it to know what's going on in there. And what's going on in there is this. There are certain key phrases, keywords and cues that say, oh yeah, right, okay. So to be able to do that, yeah, to be able to investigate requirements, to be able to assess different business solutions, to be able to analyze stakeholder objectives, identify potential benefits and so on, you need to be able to have these skills. You need to be able to understand stakeholders' roles. You need to be able to analyze and manage requirements. You need to be able to model business processes. You need to be able to plan acceptance testing. It was all in that first lot of text that we saw. It was just hidden. But that's not all, as you can tell from the graphic. <laughs> that those, um, what might be seen as technical skills, need to be underpinned by the ability to conduct yourself in the world of business analysis, to be able to interview people, to be able to gather information, to be able to facilitate workshops, to be able to write coherent and cohesive reports and present your findings, and to be able to uh, cost-justify and balance the economics of different solutions. And they are much more translatable to learning solutions. Now, the learning solution, I'm not saying, you know, go on a course for this, go on a course for that, otherwise it happens. You know, I could draw a one-to-one -one mapping with each of those. Right? But um, what we're looking at are, are options like peer mentoring, coaching, um, the assignment of tasks to develop skills, uh, internally sourced training, extern externally sourced le learning options. There's all sorts of solutions available. What's important is to have identified what the granular skills are that actually make up a single Sophia skill. Okay, so the common requirement then for us to map courses to Sophia is one that doesn't have a simple answer. Sophia was not developed as an index to learning solutions. Uh, and now, nor are courses developed to address particular Sophia skills. Like I mentioned a moment ago, Sophia skills are rounded competencies. They include a lot of experiential elements as well as teachable content. Some Sophia skills can't be taught. Innovation, research, yeah. emerging technology monitoring. It's just something you do, uh, not something you go on a course to do, to learn how to do. Also, foundation courses, overview courses, awareness courses, and upgrade courses. Upgrade, updating your skills from SQL Server 2005 to SQL Server 2008. Where does that appear? It doesn't touch the Sophia radar at all. It doesn't move your skills anywhere on the Sophia radar. It just gives you a, a new set of technology to work with. So not all courses map to Sophia. And those that do don't map cleanly. So you take something like service level management... What I've identified here are seven courses that all map to service level management, but only one of them is a course about service level management. And that's the second one, the BCS Specialist Certificate. The others have content that's relevant to the business of service level management. Okay, and you need to be aware of that. So the, the, the simplistic view that you say, well, I need to be at level five of service level management, what course can I do? You know, there simply isn't an easy answer. In addition to the clear matches, there are a couple of supporting skills there, influencing skills and effective vendor relationships, which between them provide you with the personal skills needed to work at level five on service level management and not just be maintaining uh, uh, incident reports and so on. So, okay, it's a complicated world and there are challenges. There are opportunities for commercial providers, but there are also pitfalls both on the provider side and on the client side. Uh, as to why it may or may not work for a particular client. And the most common one is that it just all looks too complicated and not really applicable to real-world day-to-day answers. So I hope in uh, that short presentation I've been able to give you some insight into how we can address that complexity and those challenges. Thank you very much. That's all for me.